Hey there, thanks for watching this video on the consumer buying process. This is Matt. We're going to walk through uh, the consumer buying process, kind of a series of five stages that we go through as consumers when we're making purchases and kind of the relevance that this has, of course, to business, which is the perspective in which we, we try to view things, of course. Uh, and so the consumer buying process I mentioned before, we'll walk through the stages, explain the purpose of it, and then we'll add in some information on why it's relevant for business. Now, the consumer buying process starts with a, a problem. And it's really stage one is what we call a problem, uh, also need recognition. And so what happens here is that there is some type of tension. And this tension is creating a, a, a actual uh, issue for us. And so we're going to take steps as a way of alleviating or relieving that tension, if you will. And so if you look at it from a, a basic physiological standpoint, if we have a need for a water, right? The tension is that, that kind of feeling that you get when you're thirsty. You have that dryness that happens kind of in your mouth and you, you have a desire to kind of solve that problem, of course. Uh, and so that's how problems uh, essentially begin. Uh, now, problems can stem from physiological needs, which is very, very basic, of course. Uh, but they can also stem from things that we see on television or the radio or we observe just through simply observation. Uh, and we find that there's a disconnect between the state of being that we're in and the state of being that we desire. And so it can be something as simple as seeing someone drive by in a really nice car and yours isn't quite nice. And so that creates an actual problem for you and you have a desire or a need for that or you see a new television commercial for a brand new smartphone and all of a sudden the smartphone that you have just really doesn't meet all the different requirements that you have and this one does all these new things and has these great features and offers these new benefits and so you have a fundamental problem. So however you get there, right? Whether it's if it's through advertising or a physiological need or whatever the case may be, what we do is we try to gather information. And so that ventures into the second stage and which we call the information searching stage or information seeking. And so in this stage here, what we're doing is we're trying to uh, essentially identify Uh, possible solutions to our problem. And so we're not necessarily evaluating or performing any type of, you know, kind of putting any type of rigor to weed out bad options versus good. We're really just trying to throw as many things as we can out there to generate as many possibilities that we can. And so we may talk to, you know, family and friends. Right, if we're looking for something specific that can that can maybe help us solve our problem, so maybe we talk to family and friends if they've been in a similar situation. Uh, me, for example, uh, I recently, and, and by recent I mean three or four years ago, uh, ran into an issue where my coffee pot broke down. Which you might think that's not a very big issue, but I drink coffee every day, unfortunately, and I love it. And so if I don't have coffee, that creates a very huge problem for me. So naturally, I start to seek information as a way of solving my particular problem. And so I looked at all different types of coffee pots. I went online, read reviews, uh, did, did searches online. I spoke with family that have different types of coffee makers and asked them about their experiences. Uh, I spoke with different friends who had coffee makers, you know, as, as I gathered as much information as I possibly could. I wasn't necessarily making a decision at that point. I was just trying to get as much opinion and perspective as I possibly can as a way of leveraging some of the context that I had and their experiences so that I don't make a bad decision. And so that would be the information seeking stage, gathering as much information as possible, using public sources, using personal sources, your own experiences. I had a coffee maker that was a certain brand. It broke. Probably not going with that one. That was my own experience, of course. Uh, so those are the things that you will do to evaluate the actual decision. Now, one of the things I should mention is that the complexity of the purchase, the expense 
of the purchase and how long lasting it is will determine how much process or how much thought you put into this process. And so if you're buying a pack of gum, right, you're not going to like evaluate information and gather as much as possible and think, okay, well, this one has this flavor and this one, the packaging looks kind of cool. You're not going to care, right? It's very, very low dollar amount. You're going to make it immediately. And if it's horrible, you just won't buy it again and you'll just go with something else. You're not going to put a lot of thought into it. Uh, and so those types of you know, convenience purchases, right, low dollar items, you're probably not going to go through the steps as extensively as you would for buying a house where it's a long lasting decision. It's very expensive, so you're going to put some time and effort into it or maybe buying a car or something like that. So once you've gathered enough information, what we do is we go on to the third stage and this is what we call the evaluation of alternatives. And so in the evaluation of alternative stage, what we're doing is we're taking the information that we have, right? In this case, for my example, right? I had some different coffee makers, right? You know, like three or four kind of picked out. And then you evaluate them. So you put forth some type of, you know, way of measuring good and bad. Your different variables, right? Price, usually something we consider, uh, maybe warranty, after purchase service, right? We consider those things, reviews. You know, me, you know, I was weighing, okay, does it have a grinder? Because I kind of like the smell of coffee when it grinds and kind of permeates through the house. Once again, I'm crazy and like coffee a lot. But that, that was something that I was, was somewhat important to me. You know, price was relatively important. I didn't care too much. I was willing to spend, you know, once again, I really like coffee. So I was willing to spend quite a bit of money to get really good coffee maker. Uh, and so I had different variables that I that I measured everything actually against. Um, we do a lot of entertaining. So one of the things that was important was having something that actually, um, you know, I didn't like brewing like one pot of decaf coffee for that one person that actually likes it in the evening. So that was also important. Uh, and so I, I had a number of different variables, some of them not mentioning, but uh, things that I was looking at in terms of the actual coffee maker. And so you evaluate all of those things by whatever is important to you. And then ultimately, in the next stage, right, stage four, you make a purchase decision. And so this is when you actually make a purchase. Now we make purchases for a number of different reasons. Uh, right, so we use completely ira or completely kind of uh, logical evaluation, right, based upon specific attributes, right, things that are objective. Uh, we can also base them based on non non uh, objective attributes and non objective factors, right, things like likability, right, like I buy clothes because if I look a certain way, people will like me, or I buy a certain car because people think well I'm important, right, and so we don't base them always on you know, logical factors. We base them off of, you know, prestige and likability and all those different things or whatever. Uh, so I ended up purchasing a specific type of, you know, coffee maker. I bought a Keurig. This is not an advertisement for Keurig. You don't have to go out and purchase one. I'm not telling you to do that. I really like it uh, and that really worked well. Uh, so I ended up buying a Keurig. That was my actual decision. So at this stage in the process, you would think that, well, we're kind of done, this is it. We go home, we're finished, we have our product, yay, it's great. Uh, but there's also a fifth stage. And that fifth stage is what we call the post-purchase behavior. And the post-purchase behavior is what sets in after the, the purchase happens. If you've realized, and this happens for high dollar items, sometimes lower dollar items, but usually for things that are more expensive. And so what happens is we begin to, once we purchase it, we start to evaluate it based upon what we thought it was going to do, right? So we, we kind of built it up in our mind and we use it and two things happen. Either we use it and it's fantastic and it's great and we have no problems, or we use the product and we start to think, well, it doesn't quite work the way that I thought. Maybe it's it doesn't brew coffee as fast as I thought it would, or the temperature isn't quite just right, or you know whatever the different factors are. Uh, and so what happens is, is a concept that is known as cognitive dissonance begins to set in. 
Cognitive dissonance is a, a fancy psychology term. Uh, really, all it refers to is buyer's remorse. And we've all gone through this, and you're probably thinking of examples in which you have. And so generally what takes place is there's a disconnect between a position that we feel like we're going to be in versus where we are. There's a difference in our present state. Uh, and so that causes some type of dissonance, if you will. And so usually with buyer's remorse, we purchase something and then we regret, regret the decision. And so naturally what we do, it's really interesting, is that we try to look for things that support our purchase. And so I don't know about you, but what I've done before is I will like look online for like favorable reviews on things just to reinforce my purchase decision to kind of pat myself on the back and say, you know what, I made a right decision. I, I'm very smart. Uh, and so we naturally do that because we don't want to feel like we made the wrong decision, right? That's never fun for anybody. You know, at the end of the day, we, wanna, we don't want to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I made a bad decision. That's not a very fun thing to do. And so we're looking for sources to reinforce our purchase decision, which is completely, completely normal. Uh, and so businesses are aware that people engage in cognitive dissonance. They are vastly aware of this. Uh, that's why many businesses offer really good return policies. This is why they offer uh, a lot of services after the fact. Uh, this is why businesses advertise all the features and benefits because hopefully you're sitting there watching television and you see the advertisement and you think, oh yeah, it does do those things. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm really smart. I made a good decision. That's what they want. There's a really good Best Buy commercial that aired probably a couple years ago, at least by the date of this video, uh, that was a it was a bunch of different kind of montages of people purchasing different products. And so one of them was a gentleman purchased a 3D TV and all of a sudden there was like a, a truck going by with an advertisement on the side of it that was advertising 4D. Uh, and so that's the example of, of cognitive dissonance is because now we, we purchase something and we think, oh man, there's already something better out there and I made a bad decision. And so one really good thing that some companies do is they actually will send kind of personalized thank you letters. And so one of the things I got from Keurig was very smart. And I knew what they were doing, but it was still very smart. Uh, was when I registered it, I got a, like a nice letter in the mail. And it was like on that thick paper. It was in a, a nice folder, right? Not, not like folded up into a just regular envelope that you see nowadays. Uh, but it was in a you know full size eight and a half by eleven envelope, and it was inside, and it was a nice thick kind of cardstock paper, uh, and it says you know dear Matt, and the first sentence is congratulations on the purchase of your Keurig blah 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 brewer, uh, your Keurig does all the following things: outlines features, outlines benefits. Once again, tells me how awesome I am, tells me about all the different things. Now they're doing that for a point. I feel really good about myself, right? I'm like, you know what? I did make the right decision. You know what? I am incredibly awesome. And you're right. I am awesome. That's great. Uh, but they're doing that for one purpose, and that's to reduce my cognitive dissonance, right? They, don't, they, they want me thinking I'm great because they don't want me returning the product. More importantly, they want me happy with it because if I'm happy with it, then I'll talk about it forever and I'll, you know, kind of market for them for free and all these different things. And it's very, very smart because by just sending that letter, they reiterated all the different features, all the different benefits to once again, remind me of why I purchased that to reduce that depending upon the extent to which I experience cognitive dissonance. So not all companies do that, but you certainly have to consider you know, if it's a high dollar item, if it's something that people have a lot of different options out there, right? If it's the only thing that does that specific function, you don't have to worry about people engaging in cognitive dissonance because they have nothing to compare it to. But if there's a high degree of competition around, you certainly have to consider the extent to which people are going to experience that buyer's remorse. That's very, very problematic. And so the value, of course, here is recognizing, obviously, that we all experience cognitive dissonance, but also by determining which stage consumers are in, whether if it's information seeking, right? If I'm a company, I want to determine how my consumers find information. Because if I know this, if I know the trough, the location where they gather information, 
I have the ability to influence them at that particular area. If I know they go to a particular site for information, maybe I try to advertise on that site or at least get favorable reviews posted on that site. And so there's certain value in doing that, right? Evaluation of alternatives. What alternatives do people consider? If I know the different alternatives, this is a question mark. If I know the different alternatives, then I know how to position myself against maybe my competitors. I know what areas to focus on, right? Where are their, let's say, weaknesses? What are my strengths? And how do I elevate those and bring their weaknesses to light as a way of positioning myself a little more favorably? Unless you understand the consumer buying process, understand what are the alternatives that your consumers evaluate, then you certainly have no opportunity to really leverage that and improve the success of your business. And then once again, kind of going backwards a little bit, but the problem and the need recognition, right? How do my consumers experience problems? If you truly have an ideal and specific understanding of your target market, then you're gonna understand what creates problems, what causes needs for your market. And then you once again have the ability to design specific products that are tailored to them as a way of solving and addressing those particular needs. So I hope that helps clarify the stage of the consumer buying process. It is a very, very important piece in marketing. It's important for businesses to not only understand it, but actually execute on it, right? Knowledge in itself is not helpful unless it is actionable. So if you have questions, feel free, post a, a question in the comment box. I'll do my best to get back to those as quickly as I can. Otherwise, thanks for watching and have a great rest of the day.